Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you for your word. It is the truth. We receive it written in our heart, written in our mind. Thank you for the revelation of it. We thank you that we have ears to hear and we take hold of the truth. We will walk in the light of it. And we praise you for what you're bringing forth this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing with you messages on the subject of exposing false teachings and all the things that the enemy has worked to bring forth and their effects in the body of Christ. This morning, we began talking about the subject of once saved, always saved, and how that is a false teaching. And we talked about many important verses that are important for you to see. If you missed it, you can catch it through the CDs or the DVDs or up on the internet. It certainly would be important for you to hear the message if you didn't hear it this morning. We're going to continue on that subject tonight, and we'll review a few of the things that we talked about. 2 Peter 2, 1, there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. The false has to be exposed, the truth has to be brought forth, so that we do not walk in anything that is contrary to the Word of God. We know that in the last days it's been declared, 1 Timothy 4, 1, the Spirit speaks expressly, in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We cannot have doctrines of devils in the body of Christ. We can only have the true doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ. And regarding the subject of salvation, we have a false doctrine that says, once saved, always saved. That once you're born again, that it does not matter what you do, that you are always saved forever. It is a false teaching. We pointed out several scriptures showing the present tense of the verb about being saved. We'll look at just a couple of these again, just briefly. 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to unto us which are saved it's the power of God. Now, as we have pointed out to you continually, we must always look up the words to see if the translation is correct. When it says, are saved, that's past tense. It sounds like it's a done deal. It's already been accomplished. Well, when we put the cursor over this word and we see in the Greek, we see that the tense is the present tense. The present tense is a continuous ongoing action, not something that's already been accomplished past tense. A simple past tense is aorist. This is present tense. The way you would translate it correctly would be unto us are those being saved, as Young's brings out, showing the ongoing work of salvation that is occurring in our person's life. So that makes a big difference. It's not as if it's a done deal already. It shows it's a work that's begun and continuing on in our life. Those being saved, it is the power of God. And we also saw important scripture for us to understand because judgment will come to the church before it comes to the world. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17 says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and that is the church. If it first begin, the word first means first in time or place, it will begin first at us. That's why the judgment is shown in Revelation 2 and 3, the church first, before it comes to the world, which is following after that. If it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Well, when it says obey, oh, what's that talking about? It's the present tense, showing those who are not obeying the gospel of God. Well, that tells you people that are not obeying the word, there's something wrong. They're not walking right before the Lord. And then he goes on and says, For, And if the righteous, we've already pointed out before that the righteous are those who are born again and are doing the word of righteousness consistently. That's what produces right, the fruits of righteousness in your life. If the righteous scarcely be saved, as it says, where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? Well, when it says righteous scarcely, the word scarcely, you put the cursor over it, it means with difficulty or not easily. 
It's because the enemy will test you and try you and attack you and try to get you to turn away from the gospel. You're going to have to stand against all the temptations and walk in line with his word. Then when it says of the righteous, with difficulty and not easily, be saved, again, past tense verb. Is that what it's saying? We put the cursor over the word here for saved. We find it is a present tense verb, not that it's a past tense already accomplished fact. Again, this would be translated if the righteous with difficulty and not easily are being saved, the present tense, ongoing action. Where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? And another scripture we looked at is also a, it's rather important. It shows the nations that are saved. There'll be nations that'll be saved. Many nations will be turned into hell because they've forgotten God and turned away from him. Revelation 21, verse 24, says, the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. Now again, is this talking about a past tense verb? The fact that it's already an accomplished work? No. Present tense. The nations of them who are being saved and are continuing in the way of the Lord because salvation is an ongoing work. They are the ones who are going to walk in the light of it. And that is important. Now, we talked about the fact that believing is continuous. We talked about present tense verbs. In other scriptures, and a couple we ought to look at, again, for those of you who weren't here, and if, you, if not, you need to hear it again. Philippians 2.12 Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, and that, that shows that not just once in a while, but consistency. Not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Well, if our salvation was already established, why are we told to work out our own salvation? Also, when you put the cursor over the word work out, it is a present tense, meaning you continually will be working out. And this statement is actually a command to you and to me. It's an imperative mood, meaning God is commanding us to be continually working out our own salvation. The teaching that says that we're already saved, God, we, have, we don't have any part to play with it at all, is a lie, obviously, because we are working out our own salvation. I mean, we have a part to play with it, play in it, which is hearing and doing the word by obedience to the word with fear and trembling. Now, can you, by your own works and the flesh, produce salvation? No. What kind of works would you be doing? God's works of obedience to the word. It's works of faith and obedience to the word. When you do that, work doing the word, what does that do? That puts God in operation, but God, God is the word. And that's why it goes on and says, for it is God which worketh in you, through the word that you're hearing and doing, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. But you have a part to play because you are commanded to be continually working out your own salvation. Another scripture that we looked at, we just need to look at these again because they're pretty important. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8. Though he were a son, speaking of Jesus, yet learned he obedience by the things he suffered, and being made perfect, he, of course, went on to perfection, of course, he never sinned. He became the author of eternal salvation. He's the savior of all mankind. For who? Unto all them that obey him. Well, that doesn't mean the fact that he's the author of eternal salvation just because you signed on the dotted line, received him, and then walk any way you want. No. He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. And when we're talking about someone obeying him, this is present tense, continually obeying him. As it said, always obeying. Obedience to the word means you're a hearer and a doer of the word. You're following the way of the Lord. And one other scripture we looked at that's pretty important, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Doctrine we talked about is important. 
Continue in them. Continue in the doctrine of the Lord. And when he tells you to continue in it, that is not try your best. That is an imperative mood. He commands you to continue in the teaching and the doctrine of the Lord. And this is present tense. So you're going to do it on an ongoing basis. Active voice, meaning you're going to do it. You're the one responsible to carry it out. For in doing this, continuing in the word, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Well, that's a, quite a statement. You're involved in seeing yourself be saved. The teaching that says you have nothing to do with being saved is a lie from the devil. You have a part to play. You shall save yourself and them that are hearing you as you are preaching the gospel unto them. That is so important. Now, we talked about several other scriptures, but one other one we might just bring up. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9. God has not appointed us to wrath. That's right. That doesn't say that we couldn't end up experiencing his wrath if we turned away from him. He said he has not appointed us to wrath. But that's not what we're supposed to have. But what are we to appointed to? To the obtaining, obtain really as it means to inquiring or the obtaining, this word really means in, in the Greek, the obtaining or the possessing or the acquiring of salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. What does that tell you? You're supposed to acquire this. You're supposed to obtain it. You're supposed to possess it. Well, that means it's not a done deal. It means this is going to be an ongoing work that you are going to be carrying out in your life. Now, that shows us right off the bat that salvation is an ongoing process and it has conditions. You and I must carry out and follow the commands, obey the word, do the things that he says. Now, we talked about many scriptures. We're going to pick up on just a few of these that we talked about before. But we won't go through all of them, of course, because we want many to get to tonight. But Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, under the church of angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works. Remember to Revelation 2 and 3, to every one of those churches, he starts out saying, I know thy works. Or more literally, he's actually saying, I have known thy works, because all of these are perfect tense verbs. Otherwise, he's looking back on all their works as he's bringing judgment to them. That thou hast a name, that thou, art, thou livest, and are dead. Oh, that's a Christian in name only. That's the guy who says he's something, but there is no evidence of it. He's dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. Several things have died out, and some were ready to die. For why are they in this state? Because of their works. For I have not found thy works fulfilled. This is not the word perfect. It is the word to be filled full or filled up or to really be fulfilled, as Young's brings it out. I've not found your works fulfilled before God. God expects our works to be fulfilled. What works? The works of working out our own salvation, obedience to the word, doing the things that he commands us to do, continuing in the word of God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard. So a guy had received at one time and heard. Hold fast and repent. If, therefore, thou shalt not watch, I'll come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. This is talking about judgments going to come. And then he says, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. Meaning all these guys, that their works were causing them to be defiled because they were walking contrary to the word of God. It says, they shall walk with me in white, the ones that aren't defiled, for they are worthy. Walking in white is walking according to righteousness, producing the fruits of righteousness unto holiness. He goes on and says, he that overcometh, and this means to conquer and carry off the victory. Every one of us must conquer and carry off the victory over the devil, over the flesh, over the world, over anything that would come against us trying to get us to sin. 
the one who conquers and carries off the victory, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And remember, the guy who is walking with him in white, he's clothed in white raiment. He's worthy. He's walking in line with the word. That's the one clothed in white raiment. And then he says, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, which tells you what? He's not going to blot out his name because he's done what needs to be done. He's walking right. He's conquered and overcome. He's got the white raiment on. It also tells you the guy who didn't overcome, the guy who didn't carry out the victory, the guy who doesn't have the clothing of the white raiment, he will get his name blotted out of the book of life. That means these guys are not going to be saved. Another scripture that we looked at that's important to realize, Revelation 3, verse 15, where it talks about the church at Laodicea. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou art cold or hot. He's looking at the works, remember. So then because thou, you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'll spew thee out of thy mouth. Lukewarm is a combination of cold and hot. So they had some good, but they also had some bad. What happens if you have a little bit of sin? Sin is a type of leaven. Little leaven leavens the whole lump, contaminates the whole thing. We cannot have sin in the camp in our life. Anything that's cold produces a lukewarm effect. How'd they get this way? Because thou sayest, I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. What was the guy's attitude? All he cared about was his temporal situation. How he was rich, how he had his goods, how he didn't have any needs anyway in this temporal life. His whole focus was on his temporal life. And God says, don't you know? You are wretched spiritually, miserable spiritually, spiritually poor, blind, and naked. That's because he was not filled up with the things of God whatsoever. And we pointed out that when it talks about wretched, what's this talking about? It's used two times in the usage, we see, two times in the New Testament. The other usage shows forth what it's talking about to be spiritually wretched from God's standpoint. Romans chapter 7, verse 24 says, O wretched man that I am, same word, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? So it means, why is the guy wretched? He's, he's got this body of death. So the guy was living after the body of death, which is the flesh. The guy in Revelation is just living according to the flesh. Someone who's living according to the flesh, according to the human nature, not putting the word first place, is spiritually wretched in God's sight. And then he says the next guy's miserable, spiritually miserable. Why is he miserable? We pointed this out. Again, this has two usage. The other one points out what this is all about. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19, which says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all, of all men most miserable. Otherwise, if we don't have any hope beyond this life, well, that means this guy was all he thinking about just this life. He wasn't thinking about the life to come whatsoever. He was not focused on anything except for just his own needs being met. So, this guy, he's living in the flesh. He is just living after his own ways, thinking about his own needs. He thinks he has need of nothing. He's spiritually blind. He's spiritually... Uh, in a st terrible state. We see back in verse 17, it says that he's poor, lacking, blind, can't see spiritually, naked, he's not clothed. Remember, we got to get this clothed with this white raiment, and he's not clothed at all. This is why he's going to be spewed out of his mouth. So this is a Christian. These are talking about Christians, not worldly people. They're going to be spewed out. They are not going to be saved. Now, we've talked about so many others, we're going to skip over because we don't have time to go through all those again, and we've got much to talk about tonight. Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. 
And then it says, And before him shall be gathered all nations. He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. So, dividing sheep from goats. The sheep do what? They follow the shepherd closely. What do the goats do? They just wander off their own way. The sheep represent the Christian who is following the Lord closely, walking in line with the Word of God, obedient, doing all that He says. The goats are the ones who just wanted off their own way. They were following their own way, walking in the flesh, not following the Word of God. He set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto the right, one on the right hand, the sheep, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Oh, that's good news for them. And then he says, why? For I was a hungered, you gave me meat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. Naked, you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? Saw thee a stranger, took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? When saw thee sick, and in prison, and came unto thee? The king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, insomuch you've done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you've done it unto me. This is someone who carried out work for the Lord in reaching out to others to minister to them. Then he'll say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. These aren't going to be saved at all. Why? Same thing. It says here, when they were hungry, he didn't give them drink. Thirsty, or meat, didn't give them drink when he was thirsty. Stranger, didn't take them in. Naked, didn't clothe them. Sick in prison, didn't visit them. He said, Lord, when saw thee all these things and didn't minister to thee? He said, Verily I say, in so much you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. If you are not a servant of the Lord and carrying out the ministry of the Lord, you're, gonna, you're a goat and you're going to be told, depart from me. That person will not be saved. We are to be carrying out the ministry of the Lord and reaching out to people. That's the ones who are the real sheep who are following after him. Another scripture we looked at this morning, but we'll just bring it up again for a moment. Matthew chapter 8. Remember, this is the centurion. The centurion was looking for Jesus to minister healing to his servant. And Jesus said he'd come and heal him. Verse 8, the centurion said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. He said, For I am a man under authority. He was submitted unto the authority of the Roman government. And because of that, having soldiers unto me, I say to this man, Go and he goeth, to another come and he cometh, to my servant, do this and he doeth it. So he was submitted to the Lord. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them, It followed, I say unto thee, I found not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And then he goes on and says, I say unto thee, that many shall come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children, or the sons, this is the word he, weos, which means sons, the sons of the kingdom, oh, those are people that are born again, shall be cast out into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why? Because they did not submit themselves unto the Lord. Instead, they just did whatever they wanted to do. All the ones who, that was the mark of this man, the centurion, he was under authority, showing he submitted unto authority over him. You must be submitted unto the Lord and under his authority and evidence by walking in the ways of the Lord. If you do so in covenant relationship and you're obedient, then you'll be saved. But these guys, they got cast out into outer darkness, he says. God expects every one of us to walk in line with his ways. Luke chapter 13, verse 3. He said, I tell you, nay, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. There's a need for us to repent. Verse 5 again, he says it again. Nay, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. There must be a repentance. That means a change in a, in a way we think and walk and choose to follow the way of the Lord. If you have real repentance, it'll be shown by fruit in your life. And it'll be shown forth by works of repentance. In Acts, it talks about that. Otherwise, 
He says, you're going to perish because you're walking contrary to the word. These guys will not be saved. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. This is where Jesus is talking about the change from the Old Testament to the New Testament in this chapter. It's where he's talked about how you know, you don't commit adultery with a woman, but if you look upon her with lust in your heart, you've already committed it. And the same one he said, you don't, um, you love your, your uh, neighbor, but you hate your enemy. And then he says, but I say unto you, love your enemy, showing the change from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Here's one of the verses in the midst of that. You have heard that it has been said by them of old, thou shalt not kill. Whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. This is talking about murdering someone. When he talks about danger, this really is kind of a watered-down word because it really means you're going to be bound under obligation and subject to and liable to the judgment. Otherwise, you're going to be judged. Well, now Jesus said he's going to give the New Testament law. But I say unto you, this is the new thing, whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be bound under obligation, subject to and liable to the judgment. Who shall ever say to this brother Raka, calling him some uh, deriding the guy, speaking evil words against him, like he's an empty uh, blockhead, a senseless type person, shall be in danger of the council. Whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Otherwise, attitudes and words are important. You can't have anger against a brother without a cause or you're going to be judged. These guys are going to be in trouble. Like you say, he's called someone a fool, you're going to be angry, in danger of hellfire. This is why, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to bless, not curse. We're supposed to pray for people. We're supposed to love people regardless of whether they're enemies or not. Anybody in the New Testament having anger with his brother without a cause is going to be in trouble. We've got to make sure that we have dealt with all sinful attitudes in our life. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate, that's the narrow gate. Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. That means there is a way for destruction. We don't want to go that way, of course, that's the broad way. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight or narrow is the gate, and narrow, this word narrow is not correct. It means pressed is the way which leads unto life. And few there be that find it. The many are walking the broad way. It's going to lead to destruction. Only the few that are walking the way of the Lord, which will be a compressed way, a pressed way. The enemy will press you. You must walk the straight, narrow path. Those are the few that are going to find it. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 20, he began to abrade the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. He said, Woe unto thee, Chorus, and woe unto thee, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works that were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto it, it should be more tolerable, tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you because they rejected the works that were being done. And thou, Capernaum, thou art exalted, which are exalted unto heaven, thou shalt be brought down to hell. Judgment's going to come on them. For if the mighty works have been done in thee, have been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. Meaning when the works of God are done, we should have repentance in our life. Otherwise, there will be a judgment that is going to come. In Matthew chapter 22, we see something very revealing. This is talking about, so we pick up in verse 8 about this wedding. He said, the wedding's ready. They which were bidden or called, bidden means called, were not worthy. Remember, we have to be worthy if we're going to be accepted before the Lord. Go ye therefore in the highways, as many as you shall find, and bid or call them to the marriage. And who is he talking about? The Jews are the ones who rejected it. So the servants went out in the highways, gathered together all they found, both bad, bad and good. So let me go back a minute. The ones who didn't respond were the ones who were the Jews. 
They did not respond to what he had told them. The wedding was ready, but they were bidden, which were the first group, which was the Jews. They weren't worthy. They rejected the gospel. So now he's saying, go out and gather together all as many as they found, both bad and good. Just find everybody, whoever you can can, which means he's calling everybody. He's calling all men. And the wedding shall be furnished with guests. Well, the king came in to see the guests. See, everybody's been called, but that doesn't mean they're automatically chosen. They have to meet the conditions to be chosen. He saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And a wedding garment is white and clean, showing forth righteousness and holiness. And he says to this guy, he didn't have on the wedding garment. We have this cursor over here. It's the word enduo, which means to clothe oneself. It is a middle voice verb. The middle voice in the Greek means the subject is doing the action for his own benefit so it gets accomplished for him. In other words, he did not clothe himself with a wedding garment. He's supposed to do it, but he didn't do it. That shows that everybody who's called has to clothe themselves with a wedding garment, which means to become white and clean and holy before the Lord. What about this guy? He said to him, Friend, how camest then thou in hither having not, not having a wedding garment? Didn't have this garment on. He was speechless. He said to the king, king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So who can come to the wedding? Only the ones who have the wedding garment on, which is clean and white, which means they've cleansed themselves and been cleaned up. We even see this referred to in Re Revelation 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Well, that's the church. The church is the one who's the wife or the bride. So she did something to make herself ready. To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. So what did she do? She cleaned herself up, she got cleansed, and she was white, which shows righteousness, arrayed in fine linen, because the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So what does that mean? She's been hearing and doing the word of righteousness that produces righteousness in her. So how do you come to the place of being one who has the wedding garment on? By being a hearer and a doer of the word of righteousness and getting yourself cleansed holy before the Lord, clean and white. If you haven't clothed yourself with a wedding garment, clean and white, from being a hearer and doer of the word and righteous, you'll not be saved. You'll be cast into outer darkness. It's also quite interesting. Revelation 17, 14, when it speaks of those who come back with Jesus after the wedding and we're coming back with Jesus for the final judgment. Verse 14, these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he's the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And they that are with him, who's with him, are called and chosen and faithful. Not just the ones called only, the ones who are called and chosen and faithful. Well, is everybody automatically who's been called chosen? No. Because if we go back, over here to Matthew 22, where we were looking at. Remember the guy who he cast him out into outer darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth? Verse 14, he says, Many are called, but few are chosen. Who will be chosen? Only the ones who have cleansed themselves and are walking in the way of righteousness. So that means the ones who are not doing the word of righteousness and not clothe themselves will not be saved. They will be cast out. Matthew 25, here it speaks about the kingdom of heaven likened to ten virgins which took their lamps, went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five were wise, five were foolish. <clears throat> the foolish ones are not going to be saved, well the wise are going to be saved. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. The oil, wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. What was the light, the oil for? For the light. That meant they had light within them. 
the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered. Midnight came, cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. All the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are, it says, gone out. But that's not a good translation because it is a present tense which would be translated properly, are going out. Why are their lamps going out? Because they didn't have what was necessary for them to keep going. Obviously, they were not following the way of the Lord. Their lamps were going out. The wise said, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. you. Go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. Everybody has to buy for themselves. The Bible talks about buying the truth. It should cost you something. It costs you time and effort to seek after the ways of the Lord. You've got to get prepared. Everybody must be prepared. While they went to buy, the bridegroom came. They that were ready went in with them to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. He did not know them. Why? Because they were not walking in the way of the word, evidenced by the fact that they didn't have the light in them. Their light was going out. They were not having what needed to be in them in order to have the light. They were the ones who were foolish. They were not prepared. And therefore, only those ones who are ready and prepared, having light in them, because they're walking in line with the Word of God, will be the ones that are going to be accepted. He says, I know you not. <laughs> no, you not. They're going to be cast out. Watch therefore, for you know not neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. They were not ready. They need to be follow we need to be following the Lord. So the foolish ones, they don't, they don't enter in. Mark chapter 3 tells us another one in verse 29. He that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost has never forgiveness but in danger of, again, he's under obligation to eternal damnation. It's the word innocuous again, which means bound, under, obligation, subject to, and liable. He's done because of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Now, what does it mean to blaspheme the Holy Spirit, and how would you do that? Well, let's go over to Matthew 12 in parallel count. Here is where Jesus was casting out the demons and saw the kingdom of God come into the people. And remember that they accused him, we go back here, of casting out the demons by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. They were saying he was casting out the demons by the devil's power. Huh. Well, that wasn't right. Of course, Jesus said that he was casting them out by the Spirit of God. And then he comes down to verse 30 and says, He that's not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Then he says, Wherefore I say unto you, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Whosoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be given him. But whosoever speaks against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world or this age, nor in the one to age to come. So, what is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? It was attributing the works of God having been done by the Holy Spirit to having been done by the devil's power. So, anybody that says that it was done by the devil's power has blasphemed the Holy Spirit, and he's through. This guy is not going to be saved as well. Another scripture we see, John chapter 5, verse 29. It speaks of those who are going to come forth. This is talking about they're in the graves, they're all going to hear his voice. They'll come forth, they that have done good, unto the resurrection of life. So it's what they've been doing, doing good. And they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. If once saved, always saved, and you received Jesus and were born again, it'd have nothing to do with your works, what you've done. But this says the opposite. The ones who have done evil, they're unto the resurrection of judgment, damnation. 
So that's why you're judged by your works. The ones that are not doing what the Word says are going to be judged and they are going to be not saved. In Romans chapter 1, verse 18, the wrath of God, which is not to happen for us, but nonetheless, it'll happen for those that are not walking right. Look what it says. It's revealed from heaven against what? All ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Anybody who's walking in ungodliness or unrighteousness is going to see the wrath of God. Well, remember we saw that one in Luke chapter 13 today where he said, I have, don't, I have not known you from whence you are, you workers of unrighteousness. Because they were walking in unrighteousness and they were the ones who were going to be cast out. He said, depart from me. Wrath is going to be revealed against ungodliness and unrighteousness. Now when it says who hold the truth and unrighteousness, that's not a good translation. The word hold means to hold back or to retain, or to restrain the truth and unrighteousness. They're holding back the truth, not holding on. Or actually, this, uh, yeah, what Young's brings forth is even better, holding down the truth in unrighteousness. If you're walking in the truth, then that's good. But if you're not, if you're walking in unrighteousness, you're holding the truth down and you're walking in another way, which is unrighteousness. And of course, that is the way of sin. And the workers of unrighteousness are going to hear, depart from me. Then he goes on in verse 21. Because that when they knew God, these are people that knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Could you be born again Christian and not glorify God and not be thankful, become vain in your imagination and see your foolish heart be darkened? Yes. They professed themselves to be wise, but became fools. They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God and the image made like of the corruptible man, the birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Because they got a reprobate mind now, see? Wherefore, God also gave them to, up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. This is homosexuality. Who changed the truth of God into a lie, worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, because we're supposed to live unto him. You can't, that's why you can't live unto yourself and be saved. So they changed the truth of God into a lie, and they started worshiping the creature themselves more than the creator. For this cause, God gave them up into vile affections, for their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Likewise, the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, receiving themselves that recompense of the air that was meat, homosexuality. And they're going to be rejected. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them to a rep over to a reprobate mind, as an unapproved mind, to do those things that are not convenient. That's why they do the things they do. You reject God, you're not going to have a mind that's going to be able to choose the ways of the Lord. He gave them over to an unapproved mind. And what did they get filled with? These guys are not saved, see? They're all judged. Filled with unrighteousness. Fornication. Fornicators don't go to heaven. Wickedness. Covetous. Maliciousness. Full of envy. Murder. Debate. Deceit. Malignity. Whispers. Backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable. These are the ones that they don't, they don't hold fast to covenant truths. Unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they commit such things that are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. And what's going to happen? They're going to be judged. They are not going to be saved whatsoever. In chapter 2, we see further, verse 5. After thy hardness and an impenitent, which means unrepented heart, you treasure up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. That means everybody who has a hard and unrepentant heart will be judged because he is to let it go. He is to confess sin and not to have these kinds of things. Verse 8, it goes on, he says, you render every man according to his deeds. Verse 8, 
unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth. But they're obeying something else. What? Obeying unrighteousness. What happens to them? Indignation and wrath. Is that what God has for us? No. Is that what's going to happen for these? Yes. Because they're not walking right. Indignation, wrath, tribulation, anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil. Of the Jew first and also the Gentiles. That means everybody. Nobody gets out of it. Romans chapter 11, verse 20. Look what it says. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. This is talking about the Jews. Thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, like you're something special, but fear. Have the fear of God before you. He goes on and says, For if God spared not the natural branches, the Jews, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. You know, that thing that always says God's good, God's always good, good all the time, all the time, God is good. It's a lie. God is a good God, but he's also a severe God. That's a false teaching out there. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity. Remember, God does, when he does his severity or judgment, it's always in righteousness. He's a righteous God. He's not doing anything wrong. He's doing what is righteous. Be therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but towards thee goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, well, there's the condition. Suppose you don't continue in his goodness. Huh. Are you going to get away with it? No, otherwise you shall also be cut off. You're cut off. You're eliminated. You're cut out. Those guys are not saved. They also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. They can come, they can get right, which the Jews can, for God is able to graft them in again. But if you're in the state of not following his ways, you're going to be cut off. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Very clear, these people will not be saved. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? They're not going to get it. You've got to be righteous, not unrighteous. And who are the unrighteous? They start listing out people that are considered unrighteous because of their actions. Be not deceived, neither fornicators. You can't be involved in sexual sin and go to heaven. It's not going to happen. Idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, Abusers of themselves with mankind. This phrase means a homosexual, one who lies with a male as with a female, a sodomite or a homosexual. Homosexuals are unrighteous and they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Thieves will not inherit it. Covetous, greedy of gain. Drunkards, ones that are intoxicated. You can't be intoxicated can't have any of this stuff. Revilers, extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. None of them. Pretty straightforward. They're done. They are not, if they're in that state, at the end, they're going to be judged. This is a scripture we looked at this morning, but we'll look at it again. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 and 2. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. He goes on and says, By which also you are saved, the gospel. And remember what we talked about. Our saved looks like it's already done deal, past tense. That's a past tense verb, right? Well, let's put the cursor over it and find out if it's right or not. Is it past tense? No. It's present tense. That's why Young's correctly says, you are being saved. Talking about through which also you who are being saved, showing the ongoing work. If, here's the condition, you keep or hold, retain, this means, keep in memory or retain that which, which is the word, that Word, logos, the word. There's two Greek words here. Why they did it this, I don't know why. That I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. Otherwise, you are being saved if you are holding fast, 
holding, retaining what's been preached to you. Well, how would that be? Because you're doing it. You're hearing and doing the word. That shows you that doers of the words are the ones that are going to be saved. Galatians chapter 5. You see, God didn't bring you into a covenant relationship with him and then you can do whatever you want. <laughs> Think about it. That's not even reality. You come into an agreement with someone in a contract and they just go and do whatever they want and don't perform, perform their part of the contract. Are you going to bring them all the blessings and give them all the benefits of it? No way. It's amazing how Christians have thrown their minds out the window and not thought about all these things when you think about it. Because you and I have come into a covenant. Here's another. The people who walk in the flesh will not be saved. Look what it says. Galatians 5.19 The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, that's unbridled lust. You've got to get that underfoot. Idolatry, witchcraft, Hatred, variance, that's contention and strife. Don't let that happen. Emulations, wrath, this is uh, anger. Strife, this is one where it's a partisanship in order to get ahead of others, essentially. I want to get ahead. I, that's what goes on in the business world all the time. Seditions, heresies. That's why we can't have false wrong doctrines that are heresies. Envyings murders, drunkenness or intoxication, revelings, the party spirit guy, and it's such like, of which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. They're finished. Present tense. This is someone who's continuing in these things and they haven't confessed their sin, repented, and turned away from them. We see another place. Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 5. Look what it says. This you know that no whoremonger, this is the word pornos for fornication, same word, it's translated fornication, fornicator five of the times, whoremonger five of the times. No for, fornicator nor unclean person, someone not cleansed, nor covetous man, who's an idolater, he's greedy for money, he's made money an idol, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. That includes someone not cleansed. That's quite a statement. That means you've got to get rid of, you've got to get cleansed. Be clean, white. These guys have no inheritance. You're not saved. And notice that no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Why does it bring that out? Because the kingdom of Christ is the millennial reign for a thousand years. After that's done, he gives the kingdom back unto the Father, and then that continues on, which is the kingdom of God referring to the Father. So essentially this means he's done forever. Because if he's this, we cannot be fornicators or have uncleanness about us, not cleansed. God expects us. That means you can't be walking in sin. Now, that blows some people's minds, but it's reality. This is what the Word of God says. Remember, sin has no dominion over you. Philippians chapter 3, verse 18. We'll go back a verse. He says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them that walk, so as you have for us an example. For many walk, remember the many that are in trouble, as opposed to the few, of whom I've told you often, and now I even tell you weeping. They're enemies of the cross of Christ. Can you be saved if you're an enemy of the cross of Christ? No way. Why are they enemies of the cross of Christ? Well, first of all, what happens to them? Their end is destruction, utter destruction, perishing. How do they get this way? They got idolatry, whose God is their belly. <laughs> they got idolatry and whose glories in their shame, who are minding earthly things. Can we be minding earthly things? No. What are we to do? I mean, what does the Bible say? Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If you then be risen with Christ, spiritually you're born again, seek those things that are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. 
When it says, seek those things above, is that a nice little suggestion, good idea, if you feel like it? No. It is a command. You are commanded to seek the things above and walk in the ways of heaven's ways, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on the things on the earth. So, can the guy who minding earthly things, is he going to, what's his end? Destruction. He's not setting his mind on the heavenly things. He's not walking in line with the Word of God. You see, the Word of God is the Word of the Covenant. When you received Jesus as personal Lord and Savior, you came into a covenant relationship with Him. The covenant promises will be performed in your life when you meet the conditions. If you don't meet the conditions, they will not be performed in our life. This teaching that says, well, I received Jesus, I'm saved, and it doesn't matter what I do, you know, is ridiculous. It's a lie. And people don't even know the word. They're sunk for sure because they don't even know the word, what they're to walk in. They don't know the promises. They don't know their responsibilities. They aren't being a doer of the word. They're in trouble. These people are not going to be saved. Now, if you've never heard this kind of teaching before, this is shocking to you, probably, especially if you've heard all the false teaching. It's once saved, always saved, doesn't matter. It's already a done, done deal. It's a lie. 1 Thessalonians 3.8 for now we live if we stand fast in the Lord. There's a condition, isn't there? If I don't stand fast in the Lord, am I going to live? No. I'll be dying instead. What happened to those guys that were in the wilderness? They were under time of testing. They didn't enter in the promised land, did they? Because they didn't follow the Lord. They were destroyed. Hebrews 10, 38. Now the just shall live by faith. If any man draw back, he's not living by faith. My soul shall have no pleasure in him. We are not of them who draw back unto what? Perdition, which means utter destruction. You draw back, you're destroyed. But of them who believe to the saving of the soul or the saving, or the preserving, is a better word, means preserving of the soul. 1 Peter, 1 John, chapter 2, verse 24. Let that therefore abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. If that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you also shall continue in the Son and the Father. What does that also say? If that which you've heard from the beginning does not remain in you, you are not continuing in the Son and in the Father. <laughs> that means you're in trouble. Similar scripture. We saw it not too long ago. We were talking about this verse. 2 John verse 9, we're talking about doctrine. Whosoever transgresses and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, that's the teaching, he doesn't have God. Are you saved if you don't have God? No way. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he has both the Father and the Son. The guy who's sinning and abiding not, because he's not walking the Word, he's not going to be saved. He doesn't have God in his life. How about in your heart? You have a hatred for somebody. Well, I'm born again. They told me I was going to be saved anyway. They lied to you. 1 John 3, 14 and 15. <clears throat> we know we pass from death unto life because we love the brethren. Are we commanded to love the brethren? Yes. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Uh, that's not somebody who's saved. And look at verse 15. Whosoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you, we, you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. He's not saved. He's done. That's why you've got to forgive. You can't have hate. I don't care what a person has done to you. They may have done the most evil thing in the world. It's wrong. But you've got to forgive them and let it go. No hatred towards anybody. 
it's only going to destroy you. You've got to forgive everybody of everything that they might have ever done unto you. So important. James chapter 5. These scriptures all clearly show not everybody's saved unless they're right with God in all these different ways that we should be. James 5, 19. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, so he's not walking the truth, and you convert him, you get him changed, so he's going to walk in the truth. Let him know that he which converts the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death. Praise God, he won't end up in spiritual death forever. And shall hide a multitude of sins. That's what we want. We don't want to lose our own soul. No, we want to make sure that we're right with the Lord. Second Peter, chapter 2, <coughs> verse 17. Look what he says. Talks of these ones. These are talking about people that are Christians who are wells without water, clouds that are carried about with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. That's, they're in trouble. Yeah, they speak great swelling words of vanity. They allure the lusts of the flesh. Much wantonness. They're full of unbridled lust. Same word for unbridled lust. Those that are, were clean escape from them who live in error. They're living in error. They're just living in deception. Promise and liberty they overcome by the servants. They're, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For whom a man's overcome, the same is brought in bondage. If they escape the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and they're again entangled again, they go back into it and overcome, the latter ends worse with them than the beginning. Again, if they go back into the ways of unrighteousness and lawlessness, they're going to hear, depart from me, I don't know you. They're going to be finished. Jude, verse 5, we saw it this morning, we'll look at it again. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, that how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, Egypt's a type of the world. We've been saved out of the world. We get born again. Afterward, destroyed them that believe not. They didn't continue to be believers because they continue, didn't continue to walk in the way of the Lord. They got destroyed. They weren't saved. These ones who are spots in your feasts of charity, feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withered, man, they lost all their fruit, no more fruit in them, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. What about these guys? Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Uh, they're not saved, are they? And this is talking about Christians. Revelation chapter 2. This is quite a statement in verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says of the churches. He that overcometh, this means conquer and carry off the victory. And we're talking about this. This is a guy who's been continually doing this because he's walking in line with the Word shall not be hurt of the second death. What's the second death? Spiritual separation from God forever. What does that imply? If the guy is not conquering and overcoming and carrying off the victory, he's going to be hurt of the second death because he's not walking in the ways of the Lord. Why would it say he's not going to be hurt of the second death unless he could be hurt of the second death? Obviously, you could be hurt of the second death. Who won't be hurt of the second death? The guy who's overcoming, conquering, carrying out the victory over the flesh, over the world, over sin, walking in the ways of the Lord. If anybody would ever worship the beast during the tribulation time, you're done. Revelation 14, verse 9, the third angel followed him, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark on the forehead, or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture under the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. The smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receives the mark of his name. They're finished. 
You cannot take it under any circumstances. Absolutely. Revelation 21, verse 8. The fearful. God wants you to get rid of fear. The unbelieving. The abominable. The murderers. The whoremongers, fornicators. The sorcerers, people involved in all the witchcraft. Idolatry. Liars. All liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire brimstone, which is the second death. You can't be a liar and be saved. Look at all these scriptures. How can anybody say, once saved, always saved, when you look at all the scriptures you looked at this morning and night? They threw their minds out the window, I guess. They didn't want to believe the word, I suppose. It's clear as a bell. We've got to walk the walk. Verse 27. There shall no wise enter into it. I'm talking about entering into the city, the gate, the city. Anything that defiles, neither whatsoever works abomination or makes a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And remember, you've got to have your name writ taken out. You can't be doing anything and defiling. That's why we've got to conquer everything. It's also these guys that have taken away from the Word of God, boy, are they in trouble. 22, 19. If any man shall take away from the, word of the, prop, the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things that are, rotten, are written in this book. These guys that have removed things from the revelation, they're finished. They're not going to be saved whatsoever. As we saw, here's the same list that we saw similar to in chapter, chapter 21. He talks about, in verse 20, 14, Blessed are they that do his commandments, they might have right to the tree of life, may enter in through the gates in the city, doing the commandments continually. But without, who are the ones that don't get in? Are the dogs, the sorcerers, the witchcraft people, the fornicators, the murderers, the idolaters, and whosoever loves and makes a lie. Can they all these be Christians? They sure can at one time, but they've turned away from it. The teaching that says once saved, always saved is a lie. God wants every one of us to walk in line with his word. 2 Peter 3, verse 9, look what it says. The Lord's not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but his long-suffering to us were not willing that any should perish. Well, that means they could. He didn't want anybody to perish but that all should come to repentance. If we don't come to repentance, we're on the perishing side, not going to be saved. God wants every single one of us to come in line with his word, put the word of God first place in our life and do all that he commands. And one of the scriptures that we looked at before, but I just want to bring it up again, in Matthew chapter 7. This is one that so many have tried to say is not talking about Christians when they're wrong. Matthew 7, verse 20, Wherefore by their fruits you shall know them. Your fruit shows forth what you've been doing, walking after. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter in the kingdom of heaven. No. No. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Present tense, continuously doing the will of the Father. This is why your works, well, your works show what you've been doing. What are you judged after? Your works. What shows whether you're going to enter into the kingdom of heaven? Whether you're doing the will of the Father which is in heaven. And then he says about the many, the many will say to me in that day, that's a lot of people. A lot of people are going to get blown away because they're not going to enter in because they haven't been doing the word. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? 
that someone who was born again had the Holy Spirit, had a gift of prophecy, was operating in it. That's a born again Christian. In my name of cast out devils is someone who was born again, had the thor- had, knew they had authority, operated in the authority, cast out demons. You can't do that unless you're a born again Christian right with God. In thy name done many wonderful works. You can't do the works of God in the name of Jesus unless you are right with God. Then I'll profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that are working, present tense, for work, ongoing, working, lawlessness. This is the word anomia. Young correctly translates it, translates it, working lawlessness. Lawlessness is abounding. Unrighteousness is abounding. Sin is abounding. And if we walk after any of those, you aren't going to be saved. You're not going to be entering in. Those who are working lawlessness, it's as if their righteousness never occurred. It's gone. And we showed you this this morning, but we'll show it again. God is a just God. A lot of people will be accusing him of being unjust, just like they did back here. They accused him of being unequal or unfair. <laughs> God is fair. He is just. Everything he is, judgment is always according to righteousness. Verse 21, if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he's committed and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Well, that's good. All his transgressions, all the sins he's committed, they shall not be mentioned. The word mentioned means remembered, recalled to mind. In his righteousness that he's done, he shall live. It's what he's doing. Because what you do is where your heart's at. Shows you're following the Lord. Shows you're obedient. It's going to be evident by the fruit. Notice, all his sins are not remembered. They're gone as if they never occurred. Isn't that exactly what God does for us? You know, he remembers our sins and iniquities no more. It's as if we never committed them. Well, wait a minute. How about if the reverse happens? When the righteous turneth away from his righteousness, ah, he was walking in righteousness, but he's not anymore, commits iniquity and doeth according to all the abominations the wicked man doeth, shall he live? The answer is no. All his righteousness that he hath done in the past, that he should have gotten all rewarded for in all these works, shall not be remembered or recalled to mind. It's as if they never occurred at all. That's why Jesus said, depart from me, you are working because I don't know you. He didn't, all their righteousness was gone. It's as if they never were righteous. Now what does that say? God views you not by only what you've done in the past, but he views you by what you're doing now and what you've done in the past in regards to the way he looks at you. Because he says, then will I profess them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who are working lawlessness now. Oh, they aren't walking in righteousness any longer. Now they're working lawlessness. So whatever you're doing at a point in time is the way God sees you. And of course, the answer was, I don't know you. All, everything was all gone. Are these guys saved? No. We know it. Depart from me. Were these guys born again before? Yes. They had the Holy Spirit. They were casting out demons. They were operating the power of God, doing the mighty works of the Lord. Once saved, always saved, is a line teaching from the devil. It's very clear. You walk in the flesh, you're not going to be saved. You walk in unrighteousness, you're not going to be saved. You walk in the ways of sin, you're not going to be saved. Lawlessness, all these things. Scriptures that we see, you go through one after another after another that we've looked at. Ungodliness, unrighteousness, unrepentant heart, murder, because you have hatred in your heart. These guys aren't going to be saved whatsoever. You don't remain in the Word, or you, continue, you, know, you don't continue in it. Well, you're going to be cut off just like the other guys got cut off. Look at all the things we saw. 
Even if you have idolatry, God is your belly, mining earthly things, on and on and on. If you're not abiding in the doctrine of Christ, that means you're expected. What does that mean? I'm expected to walk in line with the Word. Is that an unreasonable expectation? No. How will God do all this? All you're called to do is hear and do the Word and walk in it and live unto Him. Just follow the Word. If you do so, you're saved. You'll always be saved. You'll stay saved. You'll see the full work of salvation be done. You're going to accomplish all the things God wants. You're going to be rewarded for all your works. And you're going to be blessed in the life to come. If you would turn away and leave, or you're walking in all these other ways, how does he know you? By your fruit, by your works. Because lawlessness is abound, the love of many is going to wax cold, and they're going to be in trouble. Why was the one person's light going out? Their lamps were going out. Because they weren't walking in line with the word, that's why they'd have light. Obviously, they turned away from it, and everything was going out. Every one of us need to make the decision that we're going to follow the Lord and put his word first place. You must understand the teaching on once saved, always saved is a lie. One of the biggest lying teachings of the devil is brought into the body of Christ, deceiving the multitudes, making them think that it doesn't matter what they do or how they live. They're still saved. Some of these guys, you ask them the question. I remember one guy. Well, you think that, uh, that our people are once saved, always saved. And he says, what about if, I commit if I'm committing a fornication and I'm living in fornication? He said, well, you'll still be saved. <laughs> that's, what the, that's what the pastor said. Sorry, that's totally contrary to the word of God. That's a lie. So that guy got deceived. Oh, I can, I can still be in fornication. It'll be okay. God will understand. And that's where the line teaching that came in says, all of our sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. That's the line teaching. Absolute abomination as goes forth in the body of Christ today. No, they're not. God knows you by what you are now and what you're walking after. Total deception. So, I trust this has helped you. If you have areas of sin in your life, you should be saying, I am going to confess all sins. I'm going to get cleansed of everything. The guy not cleansed, he doesn't enter in the kingdom, remember. I am going to walk in the way of the word of God and put the word first place, and I'm going to follow the Lord 100%. I'm going to find out what the word says and be a hearer and a doer of it, and I'll be saved and always stay saved. And you have confidence and you know you're saved. I'm not afraid that maybe I'm not saved. I know I'm saved. But I know that if I ever walked away, I wouldn't be. I'm not about to even consider that. You wouldn't want to consider that either. You want to walk and lie with the Word. Put Him first place in your life. Be a doer of the Word. You can't be in compromise. You can't be on the sidelines. You can't be a hypocrite. The hypocrites are cast out too. We saw that this morning. You can't be an unprofitable servant. He gets cast out into the outer, fire, outer darkness as well. Otherwise, if you came into covenant relationship with God, you're to walk according to it. God is a just God. And you follow what he says, you're going to be blessed. And that's what we want. I trust this has helped you. And if this is totally up, up, cause an upheaval in your life from what you've heard, good. It needs to be. Because we have to get rid of this blind, false teaching and walk in line with the truth. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word that reveals once saved, always saved is a lie. I see all the scriptures. I see the conditions that show forth I'm saved. I see those who are not saved, who are not going to inherit the kingdom, who are not going to be able to enter in because of the things they were doing that were contrary to the word. They were not walking in the way of the Lord. I make the decision. I'm going to follow the Lord, be a doer of the word all the days of my life. I thank you. I am saved. I will stay saved. I will continue to see the work of salvation be accomplished in my life. And I am confident 
that I will be with the Lord at the end of my days. Thank you, Lord. I will always follow you. And I will minister to others this truth so they are not deceived by the false doctrines of the devil that have come into the church. Thank you, Lord. I will be one of the few walking the straight and narrow path, the way of salvation, all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. This morning's and this evening's messages, you put those together, it's a tremendous message and revelation of what you and I are to walk after. And we must follow the way of the Lord. Father, I thank you for the truth that has come forth. I thank you that we have received the truth. And praise God, we're not under any line teaching any longer. We are following the truth, and we will follow you. Thank you for the salvation of the Lord being accomplished in our life on an ongoing basis as we stay in that state following after you. Thank you for the truth, and we thank you that we will share the truth with others so that they come out of the line teachings. Thank you, Father for the continual work you're bringing forth in each one of our lives as we are hearers and doers of the word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God.